Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Welcome to the third part of the Bill McKibben series, The Art of Balancing Soils. Uh, we have talked about the standard soil test. We have talked about the water-soluble paste extract. And I think the last thing to talk about, guys, is, uh, is water. And then more importantly, how does the water tie back into those other two? So uh, once again, I am with uh, our friend Bill McKibben, who is the agronomist at Logan Labs. And of course, our compadre, Kevin Hicks of Earthworks on the West Coast. And uh, Bill, we need to learn up a little bit about water. Uh, and we know uh, Kevin and I certainly spend a lot of time talking to our clients about the impact that water has on what we talked about the last couple of weeks, the paste extract uh, and the standard test. And certainly when we talk to clients, uh, it, it gets back to as we focus on that paste extract and that solubility, usually the answers to any potential red flags is on that water test. And, and, and I know from talking to you and other Brookside consultants over the year, a lot of folks on that side of the world, not so much you, but uh, other consultants say that we don't need to uh, run paste extracts because we know what our water looks like. Obviously, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I don't think you subscribe to that. But, but it's interesting when you compare all this data now, and again, what we've really done in this series is now brought together these three tests. And I, I use the analogy often, Bill, that you know, looking at a standard test exclusively on a soil is like trying to read in a room with just a candle. When you bring the paste extract to the table, now you have a 40 watt light bulb. When you bring the third piece of this puzzle, the water test, now you're looking at data with a 100 watt light bulb and you can really see the big picture because now you have the impact that the water is doing, you have that paste extract data, and you have uh, the standard foundation soil test that gives us that, you know, that baseline. So having said all of that, um, what, from your perspective, what is the first thing we want to look at when we're looking at water? And give us a little water 101 <laughs> from Bill McKibben. Uh, let, me, let me just clarify this and say, I'm a soil chemist, not a water, water uh, chemist. But, uh, Which is fine. Uh, but, but it is things that uh, water certainly has a huge impact especially in the, uh, in the turf area, sports fields, or, or any agricultural where they're doing irrigation. So, uh, you know, the first thing that I'm going to look at when I get a soil or a water report is to look at that, um, that soluble salts that, and the bicarbs. So those are the two primary problems that, uh, that affect the soils. And, and when I look at a water analysis, I'm not necessarily looking at and saying, well, that's pretty good water. I'm uh, basically saying that, how's this water gonna affect the soils? And, um, and that's, that's, I look at it from, from that perspective. And so that makes it a little different than somebody uh, who just says, well, this water is okay. And I'm saying that, yeah, maybe okay, but how you water the uh, frequency and the, uh, the amount that you water will have a dramatic effect on accumulating salts or um, affecting how that soil responds. So when you're looking at the water, you, you're, you're focused, you'd mentioned salt concentration is number one. Um, I tend to look at milli equivalents, but salt concentration uh, is clearly probably, right, the biggest red flag that we're going to be looking at. I mean, yes. when, when I tend to look at water and pastes, I tend to look at red flags. What is going to impact my client the most? Um, and, and I think, you know, we talked about this last uh, session with you on the paste, and you really kind of spun my head on this whole salt concentration and, and the impact of it. But um, clearly that salt concentration, more so than even looking at sodium or chloride, it's that cumulative salt concentration yes. that is the single biggest red flag. Is that right. fair? Right. And so, you know, if, if we kind of set up a limit that we'd like to see, maybe someplace around 1,000, 1,200 ppm of salt, uh, 
and you have a water that has uh, 500 ppm of uh, soluble salts, two irrigation cycles and you, without flushing, you're, you're already our limits. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's the, uh, the issue that I think we have to look at when we, we talk about soils and water. You know, you brought that up, and that was one of the things that really kind of uh, 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 burned my, uh, my, my thought process is, and, and it might be simply that I tend to be, Kevin and I tend to be working more in the uh, golf course industry where they're running irrigation cycles every day. When we see salt levels that are even pushing 500, we start to compare that to the paste extract and we see accumulation of salts. You know, when we see a thousand, that's, that's a really major red flag. Kevin had shared with us yesterday a, a, a client uh, that Kevin's been working with, and we see a salt concentration here of, of over 1,500. And that is uh, what we call our wall of fame. <laughs> that's one, <laughs> one, of the, one of the samples that we look at this and we're all, you know, as a team, and Kevin did this yesterday when we were on our agronomy meeting yesterday with, with the Earthworks team, we passed this around and said, you know, what do you do? We've got a 1,500, uh, you know, PPMs of salt, and, and clearly they're struggling to grow grass, they're, and, and it's, it's all coming through the paste extract. The paste extract is horrific, but, um, you know, uh, what do you do? So you've got that level of salt concentration. Can you treat the water effectively? Is there a way to, I mean, obviously what we typically dance around is, you're not going to change the water. You're going to manage the soil differently. How do you handle that with a client? Um, I look at it, and, and if I have a client that shows me that kind of level, I tell them flat out, find somebody to treat it. Yeah, or move. <laughs> or move, yeah. <laughs> with what? Right. With what, Bill? Let's talk about that. What, what if that's, if that's the, the, the triggering number, what what courses of action do we have at our disposal? What what type of treatment are you talking about? Well, of course, I'm not in the treatment business, but I look. I mean, one of the opportun or options that you would have would be uh, reverse osmosis. You know, somebody might look at that thing and say, "Oh my gosh, the, the bicarbonates are 275," uh, according to this mm -hmm. report here. And so, you know, I want, I want to run a sulfur burner on that thing. Well, that's still not going to really knock the salts down that much. When you've It'll got, knock bicarbonates down, right? But not salts. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, bar, bicarbonates are part of this, the soluble salts. Right. But, I mean, even if you took all those bicarbonates out of there, you're going to still be at uh, about 1,300 uh, parts per million soluble salts. So, you know, that's, that's not... Um, that's not a real option as far as I'm concerned. And even, you know, you can't flush these soils because you can only flush these soils down to the level of what the water is. So the, the best, I mean, if we did two irrigation cycles, now we had, and we didn't uh, uh, leach it on through, we've got 3000 parts per million soluble salts. And, uh, and, and so you say flush it, okay, I can flush it back down to 1,500, but that's as, that's as good right. as it's going to get. Right, flushing with bad water. Talk to us about the, osmo, uh, the reverse osmosis. Is that feasible? Is that economically feasible on a large operation, a farm or golf course? I don't think so. I don't think so. The other thing is be rain collection and put, get a pond. Uh, but even, yeah, exactly. I mean, even if you did get reverse osmosis, wouldn't you then just be pouring out the cleanest water ever and you'd be stripping everything out of your soil? Well, you, you might, but if you wanted to make that more economical, you, you blend that reverse osmosis in with your okay. irrigation water, pull that uh, uh, the soluble salts level down to a four or 500 and, and go with a blend. The water so, delivery system in, in Scottsdale has been doing that um, for a price. It's, yeah, very it's not expensive. cheap. It's not cheap. And, and it's very inefficient too, but it's definitely, so they're blending back into their, either their CAP or their, or their, uh, their raw water, uh, some RO and, and kind of finding that balance between, you know, ultra clean and ultra not clean. Well, and, and I don't, uh, I, I know that um, there in my home at one time, I had reverse osmosis and we were backwashing probably twice as much water as what we were getting through the RO. So, you know, if you're concerned about water, yeah. Um, on the on the home systems, it's usually a ten to one. 
yeah. of, of back flush. So that, that's the inefficiency. Yeah. If you're talking the desert Southwest, it almost becomes an impossibility because water, every drop is so critical to begin with. You can't be dumped. Even if even the most efficient systems, they're probably dumping half of it. Right. Yeah, we, we actually use RO water in our, our facility where we make our liquid fertilizers, but we're not running a ton of water. But at least it, it gives us a clean starting point and we're not dealing with any contaminants that might come from, uh, from, the, uh, from the local water system. Bill, let's walk through the water test, if you, if you don't mind, uh, just so we can kind of help folks understand what we're looking at. And, and I hope I, I'm going to ask you a question now that you, you uh, are comfortable with. But the test that we passed around yesterday, we're also looking at a hardness number of 1,152. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I talk about this a lot. So well, what, yeah. what, what are we looking at? On, on, so the first part of obviously the first thing on the test is pH, which uh, let's talk about that before we talk about anything. pH of the water in, in a heavily used irrigation system is going to significantly influence the pH of the soil. Is that a fair statement? That is, that is exactly right. And so if, if you've got 7.5 water, now here's, the, here's a little bit of the issue though. You can look at uh, 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 this water that has 1,500 soluble salts, it's 7.5. And uh, if you look at the Coeur sample that I have in front of me, I mean, it has soluble salts of uh, 28, and the yeah. pH is 71. So when you start looking at um, these these levels, I don't I don't look at hardness because I think that has more to do with water softening and, and that type yeah. of thing. I, I would drop down to like like alkalinity, and so because the alkalinity is more like the uh, let's just call it the CEC or TEC of the of the water, so or or which contributes to a buffering capacity. So if you're going to try to change the water, the higher the alkalinity, or in in in, in two, the higher the hardness, uh, the more difficult it is is going to to correct the water. On my guideline sheet that I think you helped me build with that we've posted on our website, we've got total alkalinity desired range from one to 100 ppms. Is that still a good number? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is uh, um, someplace in there. I mean, you get down there towards the, the bottom end, you're going to be having, you're going to have water that's going to strip stuff out of the soil. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a better, that's a heck of a lot better range than having this uh, alkalinity at 225. Yeah, so, no, this, the one, yeah, we're looking at a sample um, for those listening that, you know, it's just an example of a really, really tough water. And we wanted to use that as, a, as an extreme case. Let's stay on the top part, of, part of, the, um, of the water test, Bill. So past hardness, now you're down in a conductivity and that's just simply uh, an EC reading. Is that how yes. the lab does that? Yes, so, that's an EC reading and that, that um, that's a measure of soluble salts. You can take the EC, uh, which is millimoles per centimeter, multiply that times 640, and that will give you soluble salts. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to match up with this soluble salt concentration number in there because one's done with the EC and, um, and the other one, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, summing up the salts. So, uh, but the conductivity, it gives a good indication of, of what, if you've got high soluble salts. This might be an unfair question, but if, if um, I was holding a EC meter and I tested my water, would it, would it be the same? Uh, are they consistent enough, a handheld EC meter? Um, uh, am I going to get close to what the laboratory at Logan Labs would actually be? I think be so. I think so. If, you if you calibrate it right, yeah. So if I'm holding an EC meter as a, as a uh, golf course superintendent or a sports turf manager or a farmer, um, uh, showing uh, a 2.44 EC has got to be pretty scary, right? I mean, that's, oh, yeah, sure. that's showing sure. me, uh, you know, right off the bat, I know I'm dealing with a lot of soluble salts, right. which is really so, what that's telling me. Right. And so if you, if you back calculate that, let's say uh, you don't really want an EC more than 0.9, because that's going to give you roughly a 500 soluble salts number. Right. So it's so yeah. that's kind of the uh, and again that's 
500 is, is would be considered good. It's just how you water and the, and the uh, frequency. Now, again, uh, and I'm going to deviate a little bit here, but, you know, I, I look at 500 soluble salts or salt concentration, and I'm looking at a soil that potentially doesn't drain real well. Will not that salt accumulate on the surface of a compacted soil? Extremely fast. So Extremely hence fast. the reason and why we look at 500 as being a potential, depending, I mean, again, this is one of the things about all of soil science is that it's a relatively subjective uh, science and or you need to really look at the really big picture. And in this case, if I know I'm dealing with a client that's got a, you know, you know again, you're talking 30,000 feet walking over a golf course green or running on the middle of a sports field, uh, you got a lot of compaction there. And this constant irrigation of a salt concentration, even at 500, is going to accumulate and cause some issues at the surface. Exactly right. Exactly right. Now, let me let me back up here a little bit and, and talk, you know, when, when you talk about pH, salts do affect pH. You know, when you they measure pH, they measure hydrogen ion concentration. Right. So, so how does the soluble salts, because it, because when you think about uh, like adding gypsum to the soil, that's a pH neutral product. It's a strong base, a strong acid. So, or if you potassium chloride or potassium sulfate, all those are strong acids, strong bases. And you say, well, they, they're not supposed to affect the pH of the soil and they won't. But in a solution, when you're talking water, adding salts to the water, what happens is the, uh, the pH meter trying to read hydrogen ion concentration, yeah. the salts will tend to block that, that reading ability. So that makes, so now the, the meter detects less hydrogen ions, which tends to raise that pH. So, um, you know, we could, um, that's just a kind of a physical thing that, that will affect that, that, um, that pH reading. You know, so, I, I don't remember if I said this when we were talking about the standard soil test, but I always ask my classes, you know, when they're talking about pH, don't look at the pH, look at what's driving the pH. And what you just described is that there's a lot of stuff in this water that's driving that pH to where it is. So you can actually kind of, uh, on both a standard soil test, if it's calcium, magnesium, oftentimes on this part of the country, you know, we have high magnesium, low calcium soils, but we have a pH well over seven and it's the magnesium driving the pH. So the question is not so much what is the pH as much as what's driving the pH. Why is the pH what it is? And that's what you just described uh, in, in this conversation, if, if uh, I'm reading you correctly. And that, that's correct. And, and so when you look at the, like I said, between the quarter lean, which has uh, soluble salts of 28 versus the 1500, I mean, the, the pHs are only four tenths of a point off. Yeah. And so when you add, add these waters to the soil, uh, this, this low, uh, low soluble salts uh, water from Coeur d'Alene, it's not gonna change your pH much. The soil will be able to resist that and, and buffer against that. It becomes a lot harder to buffer against uh, a high soluble salts uh, uh, issue. Explain to us what sodium absorption ratio is and how you calculate it. Oh, well, you're going to, I don't, I, I'm getting too old to remember Susan, how to calculate <laughs> that <laughs> stuff. Huh? But, you know, sodium absorption is, is we're concerned is how much will sodium take over the colloids? And it becomes less an issue in, in sands than it does in clays. So when you get, uh, when you get a high clay soil, maybe on the fairways or where you've got more clays, what the uh, high sodium absorption ratio, if they get a big number, it's going to uh, attach a lot of sodium to the colloids, which then stretches the, uh, uh, the clays apart. They act independently, they seal over, things get tight, they don't, they don't percolate well, don't infiltrate well. And so, you know, that, that number uh, is, is just a great indicator of uh, uh, of where uh, what physical conditions you might have using that water. Now, if you look at a, a sodium absorption ratio of one point uh, that's one point two six on that high soluble salts, you know initially they'd say, well, that's that's not all too all bad. But again, it's looking at the cumulative effect, um, and and this 
this uh, sample, you know, when you're just strictly looking at sodium, that's the that's a big single charge cation that will tend to hold the uh, the particles apart, and that gives you that that uh, that problem with structure. So, but, uh, can we back up for a minute on uh, on your comment about clay versus sand? Is it just by the sheer number of exchange sites that the clays are more affected, or is it something else? Well. No, no, you're really looking more at particle size because clays, uh, in order to get uh, infiltration and percolation, you, you've got to have it have it to uh, to flocculate, to, flocculate. And to be in that granular form. So if you can't do that, then then you really have a problem with with uh, water infiltration. But we're we're break, by that buildup, we're breaking down that soil structure and really right. making it right. unworkable. Right. The first sentence in our irrigation water guideline when it references sodium absorption ratio is this is an expression of the sodium hazard of irrigation water. So it right. gives us an indication as to how potentially damaging that sodium is. Let's right. move down to that section on the test bill uh, where it shows us uh, the cations. Uh, and we break it out between PPMs, milliequivalents, and then pounds per acre. Um, why, why do we do that? Why does the lab show us all three and uh, does it become confusing ever? And the answer to that is yes. But, yeah. but yeah, that's, that, that's so that uh, uh, people have to hire people like me. To, exactly, to help exactly. Them just keeping yourself in business. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I like, I, I mean, first of all, when you look at water quality, you're, you're, I always go to the, the parts per million. And, and, but in order to figure the balance of the water, just like we figure the balance in soils, we have to then go to milliequivalents. And I, and I love to take these, uh, these milliequivalents, add them up, get a total number, and then take that, that uh, total number and uh, divide that in each of the, the calcium milliequivalents, the magnesium milliequivalents, the, the sodium and the potassium. And that's going to give me the balance that this water is going to drive. Uh, so you could take a look if you if you add them all up and and then you divide sodium into the total and it's fifty percent. You know you've got a pretty sodic water from that from that section. Right, right. Now correct me if I'm wrong. The way I have explained milli equivalents is that it's like comparing basketballs to to uh, ping pong balls. It takes out the virtual weight difference and it evens out the comparison of the elements when you're that's, looking at milli equivalents. So I, instead I of it being good. weight based, it's now you know a size based. It's now it's evening it out a little bit more. Right, right. That's that's right. That's right. So so when you look at like on a on a on a soil report, you look at a mill equivalent of calcium, that's equivalent to 400 pounds, but a mill equivalent of magnesium is only 240. So, now, and that's part, partly due to the molecular weight and, and, and people don't really need to understand that a whole yeah, lot. It's I know just uh, know, how to, know, know how to take these numbers and add them up, divide them out and see what your what direction it's going to drive the, the, yeah. the balance in your soil. The interesting thing on the test that we've been talking about with this 1500 um, ppms of salt concentration is that when you look at the milli equivalents um, and compare it to magnesium and calcium, the salt the sodium is actually significantly lower. Uh, yes. You know, I tend to my eyes tend to go to that milli equivalents first, and I look to see, you know, which cation is the predominant cation. In this case, the predominant cation is, is clearly calcium. Is the calcium and that pretty strong magnesium uh, a part of this salt concentration? Yes, yes. And so that's why you, you see on this report, you see the sodium absorption ratio isn't very high. Right. Uh, but you definitely got problems when you're trying, trying to grow grass or grow a crop in, a, in that salty of water. So is, would you consider this a salty water, a problematic water, even though the sodium, although chlorides are pretty, pretty high, I mean, at 375 ppms, they're pretty high on this. Uh, is that a, a concern? I mean, those are still major concerns when we're looking at this. Sure. Uh, I, I, yeah, sodium is not going to be the issue here. It, right. It's going to be you know, and salts, salts are salts and salts. And most people look at, uh, when you talk soluble salts, they, right away they think in sodium. 
No, it's right. all the cations, all the all the anions. And and exactly. that when that concentration gets too high, the, the tendency is going to be for it to suck uh, fresh water back away from the plant. So the plant has to work a lot harder trying to pick up that that those those uh, the water and the nutrients. And so in situations where we have uh, where we're borderlining on salts, you definitely want to have better phosphorus numbers in your soil because that controls the energy in the plant and that will help to uh, to compensate. We also, yeah. obviously at Earthworks, we also talk a lot about getting biology working so we can sequester some of these salts, which we've, we've been able to, to see pretty effectively. But it's interesting when, you know, and that's why I wanted to use this as an example, because it's not just the sodium here that's right. driving this salt concentration. It's a little bit of everything. But what you just described, Bill, is what we see often is what we call sodium-induced wilt, or we probably should call it salt-induced wilt, yes. which is where the plant does start to pull in a lot of moisture, uh, especially in grass. Now you start to get a puffy plant and, and you get a plant that dehydrates quickly and wilts quickly, even when the soil moisture levels are there. And a lot of times our clients will come to us and say, I'm seeing wilt and you know, they, they may think it's uh, you know, an assistant not doing his job or you know, on the phone or something like that. Yeah. And the reality is that it's a chemical induced wilt. It's not a environment induced wilt. It's not a water wilt. It's a chemical wilt. And this is a perfect example. You can see that information on this test and I believe, and I think you would agree with me, is that you would see the same basic information if you were looking at just the paste extract. Fair? Sure, sure. And, and so when, when you have, have fresh water being pulled away from the plant, I mean, you could have just watered it. Right. And, and, uh, and, and with those high levels of salts, plus any salts that might have gotten dissolved from that, now it's not 1,500 anymore. It's probably closer to 2,000. Yeah. So, so when the sun comes out, it can't, it can't, uh, it can't pull fresh water in. Now, the other thing we've, we've talked about phosphorus being a hedge against salts. So is, is uh, potassium is a hedge against high salts because that's going to, that's going to manipulate the stomata so that they can, they can open and close properly. If, if the potassium is really low, the stomata is going to be extremely, uh, um, uh, loose and it's not going to close up tight and so the plant's going to keep bleeding off mm -hmm. off water. And when you're talking phosphorus potassium you really are talking about bioavailable phosphorus so the plant's taking it in. Yes. So we've got to find a mechanism by which those elements are moving into the plant to buffer this sodium intracellularly. If it's just sitting there and locked up on the soil it's not helping us in the scenario that we're talking right. about. Right. We've got to get it into the plant. So again, we come back, to, you know, we come back to biological soil management in bringing biology to the table so that we can get some of these uh, nutrients to really truly mobilize. Uh, let's, let's roll down to that last section on there. And, uh, the, the, you know, you had already talked about total alkalinity, but let's talk about bicarbonates. What are they? What do they do? What's the impact? Explain to us collectively uh, the, the nature of bicarbonates. In the in the dissociation of calcium carbonate, you will have, uh, you have basically a, a calcium hydroxide will break off, but you, you, it will leave you with a calcium bicarbonate, uh, or both of them tend to dissociate in solution. So the bicarbonate is just part of the dissociation of lime. Um, and in well waters, we tip typically see a lot of lot of bicarbonate the deeper you go the worse it is uh, so um, you know if you if you're going into some of this limestone you can just bet that the bicarbonates are going to be high there. and and bicarbonates have um, uh, some interesting issues you, you talk about uh, uh, dry spots and things like that when you get high bicarbonates as the soils dry down the bicarbonate will uh, the, the microbes and, and the, the, the plants will pull up water, and so that'll leave the, the carbonate there, and then you'll have, uh, it'll precipitate out calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate uh, is, is critical. We've got to have calcium, and that's to get root development, to get cell wall integrity. So when we have high bicarbonates, we also increase or decrease our root, root uh, regeneration, we also decrease the uh, 
uh, cell wall integrity, and we, so that consequently we increase our disease pressure. And um, so, by, and then once bicarbonate, once calcium carbonate tends to uh, uh, precipitate out. That's a prime uh, target for uh, uh, calcium will, will precipitate out any of the soluble phosphorus and into a rock phosphate. And, um, and then that's very low solubility. It will eventually come back, but maybe not fast enough. So you get this domino effect from bicarbonates. And um, you, know, you can see those things uh, in the landscape, you know, they tend to be just on the on the fringe of low spots, uh, uh, or, or you know, in areas where where water may may kind of accumulate and then leach off. So, we, so Bill, th this without getting too specific, this is a a well of a client in the Front Range of Colorado. Um, they're they're barely reaching 12 inches of precip for the year so far. Um, the, from what I'm hearing, it's also it's also a site that's been pretty heavily irrigated, uh, probably beyond what's necessary. But to back off of that at this point in the year, where we're still not seeing any any natural rainfall, if I'm reading it right, it sounds like we may be actually doing more harm than good by by backing off on watering. Is that is that correct? That's correct because so let's just say you put uh, one gram of salt in 10 milliliters of water and and now you evaporate that water off right. to five milliliters. Now you've got essentially two grams in the water. So the drier that soil gets, the worse the salt concentration. So, so this salt concentration on the pounds per acre basis is 355 pounds per acre inch of water. An acre inch is 27,000 gallons. It's very feasible that that is applied in this climate in less than a week's time. So 355 pounds of salts are essentially being left behind after, after evapotranspiration and evaporation happens, right? Right, right. For every acre inch. Right. So, so the key thing here is if you know this and, and you, you are able to survive, you know, obviously they're still growing some crops, maybe struggling. Um, the key thing is to try to increase organic matter so you can buffer against this. Right. And, and that, um, that's not easy, that easy fix either. We may, we may have a few solutions to that. <laughs> yes. Hey, Bill, let's keep uh, talking bicarbonates. What's the impact visually uh, of a buildup of bicarbonates? And particularly, uh, you know, again, we're talking uh, golf course environments, but in any soil environment, can you see bicarbonates if they're really high? Are they visual? Well, I, I think those dry spots, when you walk on the grass, you'll see it, it, it kind of looks a little black. I mean, it, it, looks, it looks dark. And um, you guys, uh, Kevin probably can describe it better than I can, but because mm -hmm. I, I don't spend a lot of time on the golf course, but uh, uh, so, you know, I think Kevin could do that better than I could. Or, well, you, you too, Joel. You, well, we, you know, you what we see, it. Bill, is we see, like you said, we see localized dry spots. So typically when a, a client, a superintendent in particular on turf, a turf manager, uh, talks to us about what we call localized dry spots, uh, we can typically go into that area, pull a sample of just that area, and see a very high mm -hmm. level of bicarbonates. And my understanding is that the bicarbonates actually seal the soil surface and, and prevent air and water from moving through, which clearly shuts down the microbial activity. Now that whole microbial mycelium, uh, you know, that glomalin isn't being produced, and the soil dries out, becomes hydrophobic. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, we focus on using wetting agents, which are great tools in this case, but it's not necessarily fixing the ultimate problem, which is the buildup of the bicarbonate. And so we flush and we mechanically try to scarify the surface to, to break up that sealed area and, and, you know, and then just keep trying to flush that bicarbonate off and out. Does that yeah, make and, sense? And one other thing that you can think about, I mean, it, you've always got to think about let's, let's let's hedge what can we do to hedge against the next season well when you look at some of these well you look at this uh, at least the uh, paste analysis 
on on this uh, landscape uh, mm -hmm. um, sample. Its pH is seven point seven. So if you want to if you want to hedge against bicarbonates, you need to get those pHs down closer to six two six zero. To try to flush some of them, break them out, and flush. So you 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 yeah you'll break them right away, just like you would with the sulfur burn. Yeah. Well, how so, are you going to do that though, Bill? When you've got, you know, again, we're we're dealing a lot in these these cases. This particular client I'm working with has a lot of calcareous uh, soils, native soils. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> how are you going to move the with what we talked about with with respect to pH? How do you move that? In in calcareous <laughs> soils, no. I mean, it's it's there's just you couldn't you couldn't economically do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you're gonna you get it you get it down to six two. You're gonna start losing level of ground. I mean, it's it's right. gonna right. It, it's just gonna it dissolve stuff. Away. So so you can't do that there. You're just gonna live with it. So Bill, on this test that we've been looking at today, uh, we also have 375 ppm's of chloride and 770 ppm's of sulfur. How bad is that? <laughs> Well, the chlorides, I was just looking at chlorides last night, kind of preparing for this. You know, we, we tend to say, well, in our, in our paste analysis, we'd like chlorides down. What, what, I, what do I have that set at? 90 or 120, yeah. something like that. And, um, um, but when you look at tolerance of plants to that level of chlorides, uh, I'm not actually sure what bluegrass or, or some of the turf is, but uh, the, the high level of tolerance will go up to 1500 so of, of chlorides so it's not um, yeah that is is part of the salts issues but just chlorides by itself is not a problem just think about when you were at a community swimming pool and and they chlorinate that water every day and you look at that water that gets splashed over the uh, concrete and into the and the grass on the other side of that it's just green as a gourd so it, it's, uh, I mean, plant, plants are fairly tolerant to chlorides, and chlorides is one of the, uh, um, the, the neutralizing or the balancing, electrical balancing uh, anions for the cations. I think you and I might disagree on this or have disagreed on this, but our concern would be you're constantly irrigating with that level of chloride. You know, why do we chlorinate water? To kill microbiology. And so what's the potential of that constant exposure to a level that high uh, to the microbiological profile, at least in the first couple of inches in that soil profile? Yeah, this is where we probably will we might disagree a little bit. Yeah, let's, let's move but, on, know, Bill. <laughs> but when they chlorinate, they chlorinate water, they chlorinate it with, with Clorox, which yeah. is Cl2. And we're, we're talking chlorides, just Cl. So, you know, I, I always tell everybody, I say, look, I say, you can take a teaspoon of Clorox and, and swallow it, and you're going to be in trouble. But you can take a teaspoon of table salt, which is sodium chloride or potassium chloride, and it's not going to be a huge problem. Buffered, yeah. So, you know, there, there is some difference there. And, and you know, when you talk about uh, a, a lot of times people just mix those, the Cl2s and the Cls, it, it's a chloride and a chlorine. And uh, it, it's that molecule, but it, it, there is some difference there. What about the sulfur on this? The sulfate is 770. Is that, uh, I, I'm quite honestly not even sure where we want to be there. Is that a concern? I, I'm not, I've not really seen a whole lot of issues with, uh, um, with high sulfates. And um, One it, of the could, it could get to the point where it actually would ding nitrates. So uh, it could interfere with nitrates, but um, uh, that, that's an easy one to, to try to override. One of the questions that came up on this particular test, we're looking at 175 pounds per acre of, of sulfate. One of the questions was uh, that I, I think our team uh, threw out was, with that much sulfate, wouldn't the pH be lower? Right. Well, not with not with all the the oh, other the big, big cations, calcium and magnesium. Yeah. So it goes so, back to the point of this piece of paper is you know a big you know lots of information and it has to be read circularly. It can't be just linear. Uh, you got to <laughs> really relate to the whole thing. Um, Bill, the last line on this page, and we've talked about salt concentration, so I think we're uh, we've got that down fairly well. But talk to us about the cation anion ratio. And actually, before we do that, I want to. 
you had started to broach, you know, some of the impact of chlorine on, on, on cement. Uh, Kevin, tell us your, your, your water story that, you know, your, your uh, agronomist was sharing with you about uh, the impact on the cement. But I, I think that's one of the best uh, yeah. water stories, but share that story with us. So I've got to give Dave Wilbur some credit on Please. this one, but the, one of these samples that we're looking at today is, is from my former golf course, Coeur d'Alene Resort, really, really clean snowpack runoff water, um, which a lot of the guys in the Colorado mountains are dealing with anywhere they're, they're using snowpack runoff for, for irrigation. And he asked me what the cart paths look like. This is when I first arrived on scene and I said, well, I, I, just soon talk about water. I'm not really interested in talking about our cart paths right now. And he said, no, just describe them for me. And I said, well, they're concrete cart paths. They've got cracks in them. You know, they probably need some repairs. He says, what does the concrete itself look like? And I said, I don't know where, I don't know where you're going with this. He says, does it look like exposed aggregate, like an exposed aggregate sort of patio? He said, and I said, you know what it does? He said, that's because your water is a stripper that's removing the lime or the calcium out of the, the concrete itself. And, and I paused and he said, what do you think that's doing in your soils? So it, it really gave me a good picture of the, of, the, of the power of water to strip certain, certain things out of the soil. So Bill, we talk about this cation anion ratio as giving us an indication as to the potential of that water to be a stripper. Is that a fair assessment of how to read that line? I, I look at it if it's you know way below uh, one cation anion ratio that we're going to start to steal cations out of the water as the water passes through the soil. Okay, well the best the best uh, uh, way to look at that is looking at the PHC. Now you don't have it on the uh, uh, this Wilbur Ellis uh, uh, report. But uh, could we run that every time, Bill? I would probably. That's the least, enhanced at, test. At least the right? first time you need to run it a couple. I mean, when you first first work with somebody, you need to do that. I mean, if you look at Coraline PHC is a nine point five. Anything above eight point four, I think, uh, indicates that it will strip nutrients out of the soil, and and so I would I would guess that the PHC on this, uh, this, this uh, Wilbur Ellis sample, which has 1500 parts per million salt, I would say that that one probably has uh, PHC lower than, than uh, because of all the salts that are in it. I mean, they're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna accumulate. Now, when you sure. look at the cation anion ratio, you know, you're only looking at 0 0.07 difference, 0 0.82 on quarter lanes and, and 0 0.8, uh, 0.89, on this this high salts one, so it it is it can be, but don't don't hang your hat on it. Explain the PHC. What does that mean, and and how do you calculate it? How, well, do, PH, how does the lab do that? PHC is the pH, but it takes into the, the account the effect of bicarbonates, and so you know because bicarbonates, uh, um, and I don't know if I can explain it really well, but uh, uh, when you have a high bicarbonates you tend to have uh, things that will accumulate or precipitate out, especially calcium. Uh, and, and you look in the case of the quarterline, PHC is above that uh, uh, 8.4 level. And so that's, that tells you that, you know, it, it's gonna strip things out uh, because so, it has very little bicarbonates in there. So anything below 8.4 is not going to strip and anything right. above 8.4, you're moving toward a stripping water. Right. Right. And, and what happens when you have a stripping water, it literally, as it passes through the colloids, it grabs the cations and pulls them out with it. I mean, the water is trying to find equilibrium. So it's trying to grab, it's going to grab a cation to create equilibrium. Is that right. a fair right. assessment on, on right. how and, this goes? And any, any, um, any uh, uh, free calcium that's there, you know, from a lime application that's not on the colloid, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll pull that away too. Hmm. So we just devoured this whole water test. Um, you know, again, we, we kind of started this conversation, Bill, uh, by, by uh, talking about the other two sections of our, our triad here, the standard soil test. Does this water test affect the 
the standard soil test very much uh, on, on the data side. I mean, are you seeing, uh, can you make an evaluation by looking at a standard soil test and then correlating the data that we just looked at on the water test on that standard soil test? Not real well. But no. you can on, on your pace. pace. Right. So when you're looking, so again, and, and I, we talked about this the last uh, session, um, you know, you, you taught us so much about that paste. And then when we start taking this data and, and laying on top of each other, it really became clear. Um, how much, and I think we talked about this last week, but I'll, I'll reiterate. Um, we've done a number of tests where we use the irrigation water on the pastes, and we've done a number of tests where we don't. And I think we agreed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the deionized water at least gives us a standard uh, and, and, and an even playing field. So there's no inconsistency that the water might bring. But if you were to put this water, and Kevin, I don't know if we got those tests back because I think we tried to run those. I did this morning, yeah. It uh, cut everything in half. Okay, so, so this water we've been looking at at 1,500 pounds uh, uh, PPMs of salt. Uh, when we ran the DI water, everything was cut in half, but it should be more consistent. Um, again, do we run irrigation water on the paste? Do we not run irrigation water on the paste? If, if you're, if you're yes. trying to save money, uh, then no, run the DI and, and run a water analysis so you know what it's going to contribute. Thank you. Now, the other thing, uh, and I know we talked about this the last time with the paste, if you start getting paste numbers back, even under irrigation, and you're, you're, you're up there towards the point of, well, turf, you're always, you know, always trying to, on the edge of, of maximum growth, um, but on, on some of the uh, agricultural production, whether it's vegetables or not, when you get up towards uh, the top end of, of production, you have to have some soluble salts there to indicate that you've got nutrition. And so if, if it's too clean, and I'll see this on some of the uh, modified mixes that come, come across my desk, desk and um, uh, they're gonna be just too clean. So on the East Coast here, we theoretically, although this summer has not been a good example, we get a lot of rain. Um, you know, obviously that rain changes our soil profile substantially. I mean, our rain, I don't see tests this big. I mean, I don't see 1500 PPMs of salt concentration typically on the East Coast, but I see 700, 800, 900. Uh, the rain flushes that out. Um, and again, even more reason for deionized water because of the the level of consistency there. Uh, the impact that that rain has on the foundation of that soil, the paste, the water, uh, how significant is it? Well, it's quite significant. The, uh, and I just happened to have a, uh, a rainwater analysis here. And, and when you look at rainwater, pH now is 6.6. .6. Yeah. used to be about 5.5. .5. So that, that, that had a real tendency to dissolve stuff put it into solution and give plants a, uh, a real shot in the arm. Uh, now that's six, six, it's not gonna do that. If you look at the rainwater salt concentration, it's 12 ppm. Um, bicarbonates is six. So it's gonna pick up some carbon dioxide as the rain falls through the atmosphere to give you some bicarbonate. But I mean, there's just nothing, nothing there. The PHC is, is at 9.3. So definitely, so definitely a, uh, a stripper. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, the rainfall can tremendous. I mean, with, with that kind of uh, water with no salts in it, and you can, you can dilute stuff down really quick. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but I'm going to ask anyway. I've got a client who doesn't have a lot of money, doesn't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, probably has some problems. This is hypothetical, obviously. Uh, I might be able to run one test. Uh, water, paste, standard soil test. What, what do, where do I start as a consultant, as a friend? As I run a, the paste test. You do. I knew you yeah, would. Yeah, because I have soluble salts in the paste. Right. Now, you, don't, you may not know if, how much the, the uh, irrigation water is contributing to that, but you do, have, you do know whether you've got a salts yeah. problem. Yeah. So like I said before, in the, in the last couple of meetings, uh, we like to run 
monitoring program. So we'll take one site consistently and run a paste, just the paste every month and just start to track that. And as I, uh, as I do that, and, and actually right before I, uh, we, we went on air here, I got a call from one of my clients that I do that on a regular basis because he just got his most recent, but he gets excited because every month at the first of the month, it's usually right about now today being September 1st. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we look at that data and we start to see that roller coaster ride. Um, and, and I, you know, and again, um, you know, of all this data that we, we stare at, um, that paste extract really tends to really bring it all home and, and really kind of, you know, close the book on what, what really is happening in the soil. And, and I'm sure you would agree with me on that being that uh, your book over my shoulder here talks a lot about this, your new book, uh, which is coming out now, <laughs> September. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about it. I've got uh, a spot on the shelf for it, Bill. Well, we, we okay, all right, I'm good, replace, good. I'm going to replace that other book with with the uh, with the new book, and we've already got our orders for cases of the new Bill McKibben book. And uh, uh, again, I'm going to encourage anybody if you don't have a copy of the Art of Balancing Soils uh, on your on your shelf, you really need to get a copy, and you can actually find that. And this is a blatant plug, although we don't make a dime on it. Um, there is a link on our website at soilfirst.com that you can find Bill's and or Jerry Brunetti's book uh, on our book. And when we get the new book out, Bill, we will also put a, uh, a big uh, spot on our website so that uh, our clients and friends can get a copy of that, although we'll probably be handing a few out ourselves. But uh, I want to thank much. you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, like I said, I mean, I, I, I mean this earnestly. Um, everybody on our team and many of our clients, that is their go-to book these days. And uh, don't tell sure. Neil Kinsey that because I think we've replaced hands-on agronomy, but still a great publication and one we yes. learned well with. But uh, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for this series. Uh, I, I uh, do want to remind folks that uh, we are going to try to put together a, a couple hours with Bill when we get the time uh, and set up a, a Soil First classroom. So a lot of this will be in one spot and we'll do a little PowerPoint so we can actually get some uh, graphic support. Um, Kevin, thank you as always for everything. And uh, uh, Bill, we're going to continue to bug you because we, we look at these pieces of paper and when we don't understand them, Let's call Bill. <laughs> and that's been, that's been our motto for a long time. It'll continue to be a motto, but I want to thank fine. everybody for uh, joining us on the, uh, on, on the Earthworks podcast. And Bill, again, always a pleasure. And Kevin, thank you so much for all your support as well. Thank yeah, you. I, I, I think what this has really done is pulled together the, the, the message that, that it is a big picture look. You can't, you can't focus on one thing and you've got to kind of have all the data in front of you. So you've got that hundred watt ball. Yeah. Right. To, to look at it. I, I think that's a great analogy. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate you, the time. You bet. Take care. Thank you guys.